So, welcome to session eight of Old Testament history, order out of chaos. But actually, this is going to be session nine, <laughs> because we're going to skip a session and come back to it in a few weeks. I was going to do a Genesis 1 session on intelligent design, but my guest teacher had to reschedule. So, welcome to Chapter 1, Session 9 <laughs> of Old Testament History. We'll get back to Session 8 in due time. I'm pretty sure that by now most of you are realizing that this is not your usual history class. I almost died a year ago or so from COVID, and when I survived and realized that God had miraculously saved me, I vowed to redouble my efforts to make a lasting mark for him on this world. I'm not going to be around forever, so I'm determined to leave a legacy that endures. So, we're doing an Old Testament history class for all Old Testament history classes. This is a core dump of as much of my knowledge as I can impart. But there still is so much more to learn because our God is that tremendous. And that's why we're still in Genesis 1. The Bible is that deep. Genesis 1 is a multi-dimensional gem able to be comprehended from multiple perspectives. I think my co-teachers and I have proven that. One cannot merely interpret it literally and then compare it with science and dismiss it as myth. It obviously is very figurative, prodigious, and multi-leveled. It's poetic, mysterious, and even musical. And as a literary work, it's beautiful. God created the universe. Everything that ever was and is and will be, all matter and energy that exists, came into being with the Big Bang. And so here we are now on Earth, spinning around in space, circling an average star in a corner of an average galaxy, hurtling through the cosmos at unimaginable speed, and contemplating our origin. <laughs> but the Bible is terra-centric, earth-centric. It makes little mention of things beyond the earth, and what it does say about the arrangements of the stars has significations to us living upon earth. So, let's go to Genesis 1.1, where it tells us that, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God created everything, heaven and earth, all the way from the up to all the way down, heaven and the earth. That's a figure of speech expressing completeness by stating the extremities and implying everything else in between. But next we learn that something cataclysmic happened between verses 1 and 2. How so? Because God said he didn't create the world that way, in chaos, in emptiness, and in darkness. He created it to be inhabited. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah 45, 18. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. It's very fascinating to note the four verbs used here in this verse. Created, formed, made, and established. Each of these describes a different facet 
of God's work in Genesis. Bara means to create. The root meaning of bara is to cut into a shape like cutting a reed to be used as a pen or cutting a stick to be used as an arrow. But its most common meaning is metaphorical, to bring into being, to create. And Isaiah 45, 7 carries the essence of this word, which is to make something out of nothing. This passage in Isaiah has a lot of references to Genesis 1, and it uses a concentration of those creational words I mentioned. I'm going to read it to you from Rotherham's Emphasized Bible, Isaiah 45, verse 5 and following. I am Yahweh, and there is none else. Beside me there is no God. I gird thee, though thou hast not known me, that men may get to know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am Yahweh, and there is none else. Forming light and creating darkness, making prosperity and creating misfortune. I, Yahweh, who does all these things, Let the drops fall, ye heavens from above, yea, let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bear as their fruit deliverance, and let justice spring forth therewith. I, Yahweh, have created it. Alas for him who contends with his fashioner, a potsherd, you know, somebody works with clay, should contend with the potsherds of the ground, the earth. Shall it be said by the clay unto him that's fashioning it? What would you make? Or thy work of thee, he hath no hands? Alas, for one who saith to a father, What are you begetting? Or to a woman, What are you bringing forth? (laughs) Thus saith Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel and his fashioner, as to things to come, they have asked me concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, they would command me. I made the earth, and man upon it I created. I, mine own hands, stretch out the heavens, and all their host I commanded. Wow, that's full of these words, created, formed, like the the potsherd who makes things out of clay, forming them and making them. It's just full of those terms. And also in there is the heavenly host. That's another detail. There's an army in heaven. The Hebrew word for there is tzaba. We'll get to that in a moment. Isaiah 45, 18, let's read that one from King James. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed it, formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it, not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. To form is yatsar, to shape The root meaning of that word is from a potter who shapes things from clay. Hence, it means to form or shape things. An example of this is found in uh, Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verse 3 through 5. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands have formed Yatsar, the dry land. The word make 
in Hebrew is asa. Um, and just like that word make is in other languages, make has taken on a wide range of meanings and applications in Hebrew, literal, metaphoric, and idiomatic. In this reference in Genesis, to make means to rework something that has already come into being, to recombine matter that already exists. Now, that brings up a point that I skipped over about bara, and it bara has that, that essence, that idea of making something out of nothing, and you get that back in Isaiah 45, verse 7, where it says in, in the emphasized Bible, forming light and creating darkness. So God worked on forming light. And in that very same process, something out of nothing occurred. The opposite, darkness. Making prosperity. God worked on making prosperity, but in the very act of making that, the opposite, misfortune, came into being. It was created. So do you see the, the essence of the word create there? It, it just appears out of nothing. God created the heavens and the earth. So back to Asa. Asa in Genesis means to rework something that's already come into being. To recombine matter that already exists. Uh, a um, example of that is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and chapter 2, 1 and 2. And God saw everything that he had made, Asa. And behold, it was very good. Those That's a trait of the things that God makes. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, the army too. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, Asa. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made, Asa. Now, back to Isaiah 45. Another creational word in that list is to be established. That's the Hebrew word, it means to be made firm and it is related to the establishments of rules and laws planning logic organization and it is the word that is connected with the foundations of the world it is the intelligence behind the design look at Proverbs chapter 3 Proverbs chapter 3. Here's a familiar verse. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall kun, direct, establish, make firm your paths. Uh, Psalm 37, 23 is another one. The steps of a good man are ordered, kun, established, made firm by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Here's another passage where these creational terms cluster. Psalm 148, Psalm 148, 1 through 8. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Saba. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded, and they were created. 
he hath also established them, making them stand. It's a different word. It's not kun, but it's related. It's a synonym. Making them stand forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass away. So establishing has to do with making decrees. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, and all ye deeps, abysses, fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. They all came into being by his command. Here's another passage that fits in that time period before Genesis 1, 2. And here it says, notice that it says before the earth was, he had prepared the heavens. This passage is speaking of wisdom, more about the intelligence that was behind the design. Proverbs 8, Proverbs 8, verse 22 and following, talking about wisdom. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I, wisdom, was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, wisdom says, as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Isn't that beautiful? Now, some people insist <laughs> that this wisdom that's spoken of here was a spiritual being which they identify as the Logos from Greek philosophy or the word, I think it's Debar, from Hebrew mysticism. But Proverbs 8 was spoken half a millennium before the Greek philosophers and even longer before the sages of Talmud fame. No, here wisdom is a personification. It's not a literal thing. We read earlier that God said he was the only one. There was none else. So there were no other beings there that helped him with creation. He spoke it into being. Also in Proverbs 8, it says, in Proverbs 8, 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. So, if this were literal, and wisdom was an actual being, well, then prudence would have to be another being, too. So, then, was the Trinity a quartet? <laughs> Do you see why this must be figurative? So, what figure is it? It's a personification. That's simple. It's even something they taught about us in, in high school English class. It is in the Figures of Speech book, uh, by E.W. Bollinger on page 861. Uh, the Greek name of it is prosopopoeia. It's from prosopon, face or person, and poieo, to make a figure by which things are rep represented or spoken of as persons, or by which we attribute intelligence by words or actions to inanimate objects or abstract ideas. The figure is employed when the absent are spoken of as being present, when the dead are spoken of as being alive, 
or when anything, like a country, is addressed as a person, then personification is the modern English name for the figure. But there's even a greater scope to bring to bear when it comes to this subject of wisdom in Proverbs, because the book of Proverbs has a structure based upon the words of a father and the words of a mother. There also are two women portrayed in Proverbs, the strange woman and her opposite, wisdom. The wrong path is portrayed as a woman of ill repute. The right path is the virtuous woman who is wisdom personified. So that's how that fits. It was not a being that helped God with the creation. It's a personification of the the intelligence behind the design. So in the beginning, God created all things. How? He commanded them into being. We saw a lot about that in the One Hope class, how heaven and earth are managed by words. But after he created everything, God did not manage the whole creation by himself because along with heaven, God created angels and they were to carry out his heavenly commands to care for what he had created. This all stems from one of God's basic traits because God is love. He could have enjoyed it, his creation all by himself. But he chose to share it, and angels are part of that. So are we. From my other classes on the seven ones of original Christianity, we picked up bits and pieces about angels. There are several different kinds of angels, cherubim, seraphim, etc., and they are ranked hierarchically with different levels of power. There are several places in the Bible that the different ranks are listed. There also are several places in the Bible that God's throne is depicted with various types of angels around it. So they do exist, but, and this is very important, because churches have gone too far into this subject, I need to emphasize the following things so as to avoid idolatry. We should not treat angels like our invisible friends. We should not pray to them. We should not try to communicate with them unless they speak to us first. There are rare occasions when people are directed by revelation to involve them, but that is the exception, not the rule. There are some people who are seers, S-E-E-R-S, who can see them from time to time, but not everyone has that ministry, and therefore we should not be taught to interact with them the way that seers do. Nathaniel was a seer. He saw angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jacob was a seer. He saw angels ascending and descending on a ladder from heaven. Why am I saying this? Because if the Lord wants to utilize angels to get something done, that's that's his business. It's not ours. We are only to believe that things get done. The how that things get done is his business. If he chooses to utilize angels to get things done, praise the Lord. If he decides to utilize other means, praise the Lord. (laughs) Do you understand? In 1977, when I visited Concordia Seminary Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana to do research, I noticed on display for the book of the month a catalog of angels. It was the size of Young's Concordance, and it was full of information about angel appearances throughout the centuries from people's testimonies. It had times and dates and names of angels, what they appeared like, what they did, a whole catalog. I think that was going a bit overboard. I have no doubt that some of the appearances were real, but I can't vouch for all of them, nor can I vouch for all the details. The only things I can vouch for are what made it into the Bible. Those things that made it into the Bible made it there for a reason. 
So, my advice is please don't get out of bounds regarding angels. I mean, <laughs> if, if an angel appears to you and asks you a question, don't tell them John Nessel said, I can't talk to you. <laughs> You can carry on a conversation with them if they initiate it. We just don't pray to them. You know, we ought not to go hunting for them. Huh? We're to give glory to God, all right? If he wants to utilize an angel to do something, that's, that's great. But we must realize that this is none of our business because they usually work invisibly, in secret. If they decide to manifest themselves in, in some way, that is phenomena, and it is the exception, not the rule. This subject, like other mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, is primarily revealed to those who are doers of the word. God can individually and personally teach us many things about both sides of the spiritual realm, but usually only if we actually are in a situation where we need that information. You know, God does not teach this stuff to spiritual couch potatoes. (laughs) If someone is telling everyone about how much revelation they're getting, but they're not doing much for the Lord, I think that's suspect. But if one is out on the front lines of the battle between good and evil, doing good works, evangelizing, pastoring, preaching, healing, etc., well, one's going to brush with angels, known or hidden, far more than if one rarely ventures into the fray. If we are spiritually observant, we may notice their presence and actions. But whether or not they choose to manifest themselves is up to them and God and not us. Consequently, the subject is in the category of spiritual phenomena, but it is appropriate to speak about them a bit in this class because angels are finite spiritual beings they have free will they have powers granted to them by God they go back and forth between the spiritual realm and the physical realm they can take on many different forms visible or invisible because God energizes all of that there is a verse in Psalms that summarizes Psalm 104, verse 4. Psalm 104, verse 4. Who, talking about God, makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. So, makes his angels spirits. Spirits is the form that they are in when they go into the spiritual realm. Also, God empowers them. He makes his ministers a flaming fire. Here it is speaking of the greatest form of empowerment. All right, he makes them a flaming fire. But they're bound by the rules of time and space because they're only at one place at one time. Look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 verse 12 here is an angel talking to daniel carrying on a conversation he said unto me fear not daniel for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself discipline yourself before thy god thy words were heard and i am come for thy words but The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for the vision is for many days. So here the curtain is parted a little bit for us to get a glimpse of the goings-on in the spiritual realm. And so this angel was bound by time and space. It was over in Persia and not with Daniel, preoccupied with the situation 
and needed help. And so Michael came and helped. You see, that's dealings in the spiritual realm. But angels don't have foreknowledge, which means they're bound by time like we are. They only know what they can observe or what God tells them. The reason I brought this subject up is that it has a bearing on what happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Something happened spiritually that caused chaos. Let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 4. Isaiah 14, verse 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Now, this in Isaiah 14 is called a proverb. That is a deep saying. There's a significance here beyond the literal then. All right? In modern terms, it is a form of a double entendre. The ancient name for this is amphibologia, which is a word or phrase that has two interpretations. If this is extended further to an entire paragraph, then it is an allegory. An allegory is an extended metaphor or hypocatastasis, while a parable is an extended simile. Since we're speaking of language, which is multifaceted and flexible, sometimes it's difficult to categorize such things. But regardless if we can label it correctly, it obviously is figurative language. The reader has to realize that and recognize it and not take things literally when things are obviously figurative. Such things signal that one must stop and take some time to see the mind picture that's being communicated. A double entendre, in modern terms, is a phrase or figure of speech that could have two meanings or that could be understood in two different ways. One of these meanings is often humorous, bawdy, or even risque. In this case, the underlining meaning is a real scream. It is a spiritual slap in the kisser to the adversary. It is speaking of two individuals here in Isaiah 14, the king of Babylon and the devil. Verse 12 even calls the king of Babylon by the devil's name. Satan has many names in the Bible, each communicating different significance. <laughs> Some th theologians scoff at the concept that there is an antithesis of God, but that actually is the height <laughs> of deception to be able to convince someone that you don't exist, <laughs> especially right after slapping them in the face. <laughs> but Isaiah 14, verse 5 continues, The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. That's the adversary. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindered. It's like the bully is getting his comeuppance and no one's interfering. Verse 7. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet and they break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no lumberjack has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirs up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So that's a personification. These guys are dead, but it's talking of them as if they're alive. And they shall all speak and say unto thee, Art thou, the adversary, become as weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, 
and the noise of thy voils. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And now here, this double entendre really sharpens, because it called the king by the other individual's name. All right, verse 13, and now we get the cause. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of, of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer had been God's right-hand assistant, but apparently that was not enough for him. He coveted the secrets of the north, the polar star around which everything revolves. He wanted the center of power and to know all the secrets that came with it. But what created thing can defeat its creator? <laughs> Especially God, who has foreknowledge, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, well, that would be an insane prospect. Yet that's what Lucifer tried. Verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee narrowly look upon thee. You know, they're squinting their eyes. And consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and that did shake kingdoms? See, instead of reveling in the secrets of the north, he will be introduced to the secrets of the pit. How excruciating. But it's just deserts. Because of all of the heavenly host, Lucifer had the best enablements to see how wondrous God was. But instead, he rebelled. Look at Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. And the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. This also is the same kind of figure as in Isaiah 14, here in Ezekiel 28, and this one is taken up against the king of Tyrus. It is a double entendre or allegory, a passage with dual significance, because the king of Tyrus had never been in Eden, but Lucifer was. When he was created, he was perfect in beauty as described by all those gemstones and musical instruments. But what did gems do? Do they make their own light, or do they reflect it? His music, too, was for praising God. Everything Lucifer had was because God had given it to him, all that beauty. But it all still depended on God. Verse 14, Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so... Thou wast on the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Lucifer was one of the cherubim in God's throne room, one of the officers in his royal court. In fact, he was the uppermost one, the one who was on top, the covering one. He was in the holy mountain of God which is the leadership hierarchy that rose up above all the rest like a mountain. 
Lucifer walked up and down. He managed the greater and lesser affairs among the stones of fire, the highest ranking angels in the spiritual temple. What a great honor and responsibility that was. But then something went very wrong. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, which is buying and selling, trading, deal-making. That's what the adversary specializes in. They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. His fall was the most tragic and greatest mistake of all time. His sin, the greatest and most treacherous and traitorous of all. And Lucifer did it to himself. Verse 17 says how? Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So it all got to his head. I will cast thee to the ground, to the earth. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, buying and selling, trading, deal-making. Therefore will I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. We're going to see that. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, a bad dream, a nightmare, and never shalt thou be any more. Who? The immediate result of this perfidy was that Lucifer was demoted and stripped of his power and authority and cast out of the mountain of God, out of the leadership hierarchy. The ultimate result will be fire. But this event was not something done in the blink of an eye. There was war. Look at Revelation Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew in the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Let's skip down to verse 7 in Revelation 12. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, as with any war, there was collateral damage. And that is what happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Satan was cast down to earth. This is his haunt. Now, look at Job. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. 
And the Lord said to Satan, What are you doing here? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So instead of being going up and down among the stones of fire in the mountain of God, now he's going up and down in the earth, dealing with the greater and lesser managing affairs in the earth and going to and fro all over it. Well, everything the adversary touches degrades. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, Second. Peter chapter 3, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers, this is verse 3, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heaven and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So earth number one was overflowed. One of the symbolic terms for the adversary's host is waters or floods and that's what fits where were lucifer and his angels banished to earth and they had limits they had a habitation look at jude jude verse 6 it talks about the angels which kept not their first estate, their first arche, a ruling position, but left their own habitation, their own dwelling place, their own jurisdiction. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. So, those chained angels during the flood had violated a boundary man may have a boundary too look at acts 17 acts 17 verse 24 god that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is lord of heaven and earth dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all, all life, breath, and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath de determined the times before appointed and the bounds, the boundary of their habitation." Wow. So with man, are our times before appointed? Like Diane was suggesting, 7,000 years? Are the bounds of our habitation the solar system? I, I don't know. But we do have times appointed, and we do have a boundary. Right? It's what it says. I don't know any more about that because the word doesn't say. <laughs> so back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. So this is the explanation. And the earth became without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That spiritual cataclysm is what made the earth without form and void. Now some people may wonder why God in all his all-knowingness and all-powerfulness and foreknowledge would have created Lucifer knowing that he would fail or doing the same with Adam and Eve. Well, why? Well, there have been several attempts at answering that. Some people have even tried to give God an excuse 
and out, saying, well, he really doesn't have exact foreknowledge. But instead, he's, he's really super intelligent that he can predict outcomes with great accuracy. So he, he really didn't know that Lucifer was going to do this, and it just happened. Well, uh, that actually is a common error when contemplating the traits of God. People fancy God as a perfect, ideal form of themselves, and they think that he would think like they think. <laughs> well, Isaiah disagrees. Look at Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 8. Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, God speaking here, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So I say, don't try to be God and deduce what he might be thinking. Don't put God in your box, because he ain't going to fit. The devil even has a warped answer for that question. Satan calls God evil for setting him up to fail. The Bible says that's what he thinks. It's there in Job. Here in Job chapter 4, we see a chilling picture of what the devil and his angels think of us. Job 4 verse 12. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair of my flesh stood up. I can't help but think those, those shows where they look for ghosts. Did you see that? Did you feel that? <laughs> it stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants. That's a lie. And his angels he charged with error. That's what the devil thinks that God did. He set us up to fail. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, dirt, that's what they think of us, whose foundations is in the dust, who are crushed like a bug, a moth. That's what they think of us. They're destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without even regarding it. Doth not their excellency which is in them vanish they die even without wisdom. <laughs> That's what the adversary thinks of us. There it is. He put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. So the devil is accusing God of setting him up to fail. In Gnosticism, Satan makes the true God out to be the bad guy and they believe Satan is the good guy ha huh, how warped is that modern Satan worship teaches the same thing well the devil and his angels were cast down to earth before this they'd occupied positions in God's hierarchy in heaven managing cosmic affairs prodigious and unimaginable now they manage dirt the spiritual war and its outcome were what caused the earth to become without form thahu 
which is in chaos, and bahu, void, empty. Now we're ready to consider these terms. Thahu means chaos, disorder, confusion, and vanity. The opposite of this is order, structure, purpose that word established. Here's an example. Deuteronomy 32.10. Deuteronomy 32.10. He found him in the desert land and in the waste, Thahu, howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. The earth had been put together by God to be inhabited, as Isaiah 45 stated. But now, that order had been destroyed and flooded, overrun by evil. His purposes thwarted, so God had to move to repair. But there was an infection present upon earth, the adversary and his host. Something to continually interfere with God's plans. It also declares that the earth was bahu, empty. Now, sure, there was still matter upon the earth. It was not empty space. But as far as God was concerned, it was empty. It was devoid of anything good. Here's an example of that in Isaiah. Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion, and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become a burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of bahu, emptiness. Jeremiah uses this same phrase, without form and void, to describe the state of Jerusalem in his time, thahu, bahu. Jeremiah 4.22 Jeremiah 4.22 For my people is foolish, and they have not known me. They are satish, which means thick-headed. They are satish, thick-headed children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. So in Jeremiah's time, there were people on earth, etc. Okay, it, it wasn't totally empty, but from a spiritual perspective, as far as God was concerned, everything was without form, in chaos, and void, empty. They were all empties floating by. So back in Genesis 1, God moved upon the waters. He invaded what had been overflowed by the adversary and began to rebuild with the opposites of chaos, which is order. That's what the word establish signifies. It takes preparation, planning, logic, rules. These are the fundamental principles of the dimensions. They are the foundations of the earth. So we'll finish up with that concept here tonight. Look at Job chapter 38. Job 38, the foundations of the earth. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. Think, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if you have understanding. 
Who hath laid the measures thereof? Do you know? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? You know, measurements are for evaluation in the word. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's talking about before the adversary fell. It's talking about when all the angels were all one. Verse 38, or chapter 38, verse 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and a thick darkness a swaddling band for it. And I break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Look at all those terms in there which express kinds of containment. And it is done by decrees. These are the foundations of the earth. Rules. See, the book of Job contrasts the goodness of God and the badness of the devil. It is actually the manual on discerning of spirits. For example, take a look at Job 26. Job 26 is talking about the rules for the spiritual dimension, the foundations of the earth in that respect. Job 26, verse 7 and following. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangs the earth upon nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not rent under them. He holds back or blocks the face of his throne. And this is talking about the adversary's throne. He blocks the personal attention of the adversary's throne by spreading his cloud upon it. He hath compassed, or described a circle on the surface, of the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. That's the boundary of darkness and light. These verses clearly express five distinct forms of containment that believers can believe for when they walk for the true God. These are ind indicated by the five independent verbs ascribed to God. Stretches out, hangeth, bindeth up, holdeth back, and compassed. The first containment mentions... Uh, it referred to what we now know as the great mystery, which was hidden until it was revealed the Apostle Paul. The empty place is the empty portion of the northern sky where the ancients had not designated any constellations. And so it was part of the story of redemption, but they didn't know what it was because it was a mystery. All right. Ah. The original designations its significance of the stellar arrangement and nomenclature was to portray the story of redemption. Every facet of that to story was told, except for the mystery. Because if Satan had known that, he would not have crucified Christ. Therefore, to God, the concealment of the great mystery is the foremost form of containment of the adversary. The next containment is in, indicated by the phrase, hangs the earth on nothing. Satan cannot violate God's natural laws. God ordered the physical realm by laws, including gravity and time. So the earth was hanging on nothing, but it was gravity taking care of it. So there's laws, gravity, time, conservation of energy and momentum, etc., so when Satan manifests a lying sign or wonder in the physical realm, he has to do so within the confines of natural law. Third, third form of containment. 
the prince of this world's cloud bursts of evil can be held back. This refers to Satan's angry, stormy rampages of evil, which if he had his way, he'd pummel with us, us with them like he did to Job. Evil waters, indicative of the spiritual realm, are bound and cannot break forth. God protects us from these with his hedge, like in Job 1.10. The adversary said, Have, Hast thou not made a hedge about him, about Job, about his house, and about all that he has on every side? Well, sure. That's the hedge of protection. This protection is maintained by our believing. It can be breached by fear. The fourth form of containment of the adversary is that his personal royal attention is blocked and obscured by God's cloud. Clouds are a covering and may indicate God's protection and concealment in the word. For example, in Exodus 4.19, Exodus 4.19 this is when they were getting ready to cross the Red Sea. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it, the pillar of cloud, came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and a darkness to them but it gave light by night to these, so that one came not near the other all that night. So that was a protection, see? We know that God is outside of the realm of the five senses, and that we see through a glass darkly. Clouds and mists, coverings and darknesses are terms used to illustrate that an entire comprehensive picture of God himself and the things of God are obscured. We can't see them from our five senses. So, accordingly, when Jesus Christ was received up into a cloud at the ascension, he will come again in the clouds in his second coming. That illustrates that he went into and will come back out of the spiritual realm beyond the five senses. All right. That also refers to the secret place, like in Psalm 91, this cloud that protects us from the adversary's prying eyes. Psalm 91, verse 1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we can believe for this. It's one of the containments of the adversary. One of the foundations of the earth we can believe that god will similarly move his hand to cover our plans from the personal attention of satan and his kingdom then the last form of containment is the boundaries or barriers which god set up to contain the spiritual realm the erosive power of satan's waters is encircled with a boundary god defined that and any encroachment of darkness is limited by light. So spiritual darkness must yield to the light of God's word. Whenever and wherever the light of God's word is spoken and believed, darkness has to go. Then in Job 26, the next verses describe five forms of God's awesome impact on the spiritual realm. These are enumerated by his word, his power, his understanding, his spirit, and his hand. So back to Job 26, the pillars of heaven, which are the highest ranking spirits in the adversary's realm, tremble and are astonished or stunned at his reproof. He, God, divides or suddenly stills the sea with his power and by his understanding he smites through shatters the chaotic storm is what the hebrew means by his spirit he hath clear skied 
the heavens, and his hand hath caused to writhe in pain the fleeing serpent. Lo, these are the uttermost plans of his ways, but how a little portion or whisper is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? So God's word, when we spoke it, when we speak it boldly, stuns, it shakes up, it dumbfounds the adversary individually, and God's power imparted by believers suddenly stills the entire quaking seas of spirit power collectively. Believers acting with spiritual understanding pierce through the confusing storms of the adversary to hit to the heart and shatter his endeavors. They find the weak spot. God's spirit manifested negates and heals the effects produced by the satanic realm and when claimed and believed by the bold and faithful, the touch of his hand causes the fleeing enemy to writhe in pain. Wow, what power there is in the spoken word when we believe it. So, the spirit realms outside of the five senses, hence it is indescribable literally, but Job 26.14 states, these concepts are the uttermost parts of his ways. <laughs> They're way out there at the limits of our five senses capabilities to understand. But God can tell us what it's kind of like by painting pictures of the pent up storm, the spiritual flood controlled, the border of darkness with light, and the aftermath, the stilled sea, the fleeing storm clouds, and the fleeing, aching serpent. These are the rules of the world that we live in today. One day they're going to change, and the new heaven and earth will be here. And the first steps toward that were taken way back in Genesis chapter 1. Bless you.